Hello and welcome to the Zoomer Hall Concert Series. I'm Kathleen Kajioka. If you are listening to us on the radio at the New Classical FM, be sure to tune in online. You can watch everything that's happening at classicalfm.ca. Well, I'm really excited about the guest we have for you today. Lara St. John isn't just another violin soloist. Sure, the Canadian virtuoso has played concertos with orchestras in North America, Europe, and Asia, the very first time when she was four, actually. And uh, she's got chops to rival anyone out there. She has been called a volcanic violinist with a huge, fabulous tone that pours out of her like molten lava. But what Lara does with her talent has always been a little bit different. Her latest project is the album called Shiksa on a record label that she founded, founded and Caligon. Many years in the making, Shiksa explores Lara's love of long lost folk tunes from Eastern Europe, the reimaginings of which we are going to enjoy this hour along with her creative partner, Matt Herskowitz. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lara St. John. Thank you. 
Live from Zimmer Hall, that was a piece called Sari Sarun by Saruj Kragian. And before that, the ferociously virtuosic Chardashian Rhapsody by Martin Kennedy, played by Lara St. John and Matt Herskowitz. We're going to hear more from Lara's album Shiksa when we come back and have a bit of a chat. Oh, just, just hold on one sec. So I'm going to walk around with a microphone. Oh. So just bear with me. I've got one right here first. Kevin yes. Goddard. I'd like to know what were the influences for the beautiful music uh, yeah. that you've been playing today? Well, a lot of it is uh, Eastern European. For example, what we just did was uh, Hungarian and Armenian. Sarisirunyar is an Armenian tune. Um, I traveled quite extensively in that area as, as a child and then later on in my, in my later teens and, and to this day, actually. And... Um, I'm always collecting. At this point, I must have tens of thousands of tunes um, in my collection and, and always listening and, and learning. I mean, there's such a great tradition from that area, especially violin-wise, especially from Romania, Hungary, this kind of thing. And, and otherwise, the songs are, are so beautiful from, uh, from those areas. So I don't know. It's just it's been a lifelong love for some reason. <laughs> well, for a good reason, in my opinion. <laughs> So the name Shiksa came from where? Because it's Eastern European for a non-Jewish girl, correct? It's actually Yiddish for a non-Jewish right. girl. Right. Um, yeah, and it, it comes from the fact that, uh, well, that's not wrong. <laughs> 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 that I call myself that. Um, but also on our album, um, percentage-wise, the, the, the most of the music on the album actually comes from Jewish origin. Um, well, some Yiddish, some Israeli. Uh, actually, we have five Ladino tunes on the album, which is Sephardic, obviously, and, um, and uh, Miserlu, which is kind of di diaspora. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's the biggest amount. But actually, on the album, I have um, every other word for shiksa in its respective language. It turns out that everyone has a word for that. <laughs> in Armenian and Arabic and Hungarian and Russian and uh, so every every in 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 Romani it's Gaji and in every language that we have represented by music I have that on the front of the album as to what they would what they would call a six foot person Canadian like me. <laughs> ah, I see. So uh, some of your repertoire, which is Hungarian. Um, right. I, I reckon tomorrow we're doing, tomorrow night we're doing Hungarian Yiddish music. Oh, awesome. Pre-19, pre, pre the war at uh, the Toronto Center of Arts. You're welcome as my guest. Oh, I would be fascinated. No, I would, I would we'll absolutely love to such a thing. talk to you after the concert. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So every type of music coming from the eastern side of the world has a lot of emotions, and it's really hard to find this click. Usually <clears throat> musicians are really good in technicality, but they don't have that uh, bond. How could you get that that's right? Because coming from the same uh, the background, it, you, you got it, <laughs> and it's rare. It, it, admittedly, it's, it's a little weird. Um, but <laughs> but even, even as a kid, like... Um, you know, my dad, for example, was was kind of an Argentinophile of all things, and so we always had a lot of uh, of tango music at home and and this kind of thing. I first played the Zigornovais and you know the Sarasati rendition when I was about nine or ten, and and thought you know ah oh, this is this is my music or something, and and then finally went to Hungary actually for the first time I was about eleven or twelve, and at that point I thought maybe I'd been like 
kidnapped by a Canadian family and, and <laughs> you know, because I mean, it just oozes music there just out of every window and, and everybody there is so, so knowledgeable about all types of music and it all kind of intertwines itself, you know, so, but, but I can't really explain it. I mean, it's, uh, I'm kind of, you know, Irish-ish, Scottish-ish, Canadian, whatever, mutt, <laughs> so. <laughs> mm. Anyway. <laughs> Welcome back. We are live from Zoomer Hall with the fantastic Canadian violinist Laura St. John, who just wowed us with a couple pieces from her new album, Shiksa. I don't think anyone's ever called an album Shiksa, Shiksa before. I can't <laughs> even say it twice in a row without messing up. I don't know why. It's not hard to say, but it's a strange title. Can you explain it? It, it is actually, it's a, a Yiddish word, which means non-Jewish girl or woman. Um, it is. Basically, I'm the eponymous shiksa of this album. Um, and I call it that because the, uh, it, it actually has 10 different titles. But percentage-wise, the amount of music on this CD, um, most of it comes from Jewish origins. So shiksa just happens to be the first title. And then after that is gaji, which is basically Romani for shiksa. <laughs> and then after that is Avigné, which is Arabic for shiksa. Anyway, it, it, it's, it's, everybody's got a word for it. And, um, and so I used them all, representative of the music on the album. And the performer. And the, yes, and the, and the performer. <laughs> so about the music on the album, this has been a long-standing uh, creation in a way for you. Can you tell us the background about how this whole idea came about? Yeah, I've been, I've been kind of... A, a, a little bit of a mini bar talk, if you will, um, a, a collector of, of sort of folk tunes um, and, and all sorts of tunes, uh, also uh, Jewish and gypsy tunes from uh, beginning in Eastern Europe and, and Hungary was my first uh, kind of love. And then I sort of branched out and discovered the Romanian stuff. And I actually lived in the former Soviet Union for a year and discovered all that stuff. And then it was like, oh, the Caucasus, check this out. Armenian music is beautiful. And, you know, so there's just, there's so much to learn somehow from that whole area. And especially for a violinist, I mean, the tradition is is so strong in, in violin playing, especially in kind of the central European area. Um, and then Otherwise, I mean, song-wise, I, I just, is there anything much more beautiful than Sarai Yar? I mean, I just, I, for some reason, they've always, like, really, I don't know, resonated with me somehow. And so I've kind of made a lifelong hobby, I suppose, of uh, collecting these tunes. I have, like, cassettes and old scratchy yeah, 78. I was going to ask you, when you say yeah. you collect them, in what form do you... Do you oh, all them? sorts of weird things. Like, I mean, I used to buy old cassette tapes in markets in Belgrade and stuff like that. And, and I used to have a little recording thing that, you know, I would take around and just have people sing for me, um, which is always fascinating, of course, because um, a lot of it is passed down, you know, it's not written down. Are any of those on the album? Um, well, yeah, actually, the, uh, the last one we're going to do, the Altanian Hora, is, uh, is from a scratchy old 78 that I got in some market somewhere in, uh, I think, in Russia. <laughs> So you had these reconfigured or reimagined by composers. How did you choose the different composers to work on these pieces? Well, I guess the idea was a little bit like, well, I know all these great composers who are, you know, relatively young and, and you know, working a lot today, and I know all these tunes, so why don't I put them all together and make sort of something of it? And and that was the beginning of the of the concept about five years ago. And 
I mean, generally, I found that the composers ended up going with their own backgrounds. Like, I would give sort of a cross-cultural, you know, like, oh, here's a Yiddish tune, here's a Hungarian, here's this. And it always turned out that the, you know, the, the people chose kind of, again, it's what resonates with you. Uh, with the exception of Martin Kennedy, who's obviously not a Hungarian, <laughs> who set that crazy Chardashian Rhapsody for me. Yeah, tell us a bit more about that, because it sounds like uh, he wrote something that he thought you were going to reject initially. Well, he, he, he just wrote as, as many crazy things as he possibly could and, and figured that I would say, oh, geez, no, I can't do that. But instead, I sort of did and added some stuff. And then <laughs> when he knew it was going to be Matt playing it, he made the piano part just as crazy. And uh, yeah, it's basically a, it's a showpiece for both piano and violin. It's kind of a, a mashup of of, uh, of the Chardash, which is uh, originally a, a Hungarian rom tune, and uh, the Hungarian Rhapsody of Liszt. So it's, uh, you know, like the, the archetypal violin tune and the archetypal piano tune from Hungary, um, all in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was definitely a blockbuster piece. And I want to talk a bit about your label called Ancalagon, which you founded. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I guess the whole point was to have artistic freedom. What was it about the major labels or corporate labels? Like, how do they function? That was something that you wanted to get away from. Well, I just, I wanted to make sure that I always had complete control um, and integrity in whatever I put out into the world. Because when you're working with major labels or, or well, basically anyone, if you work for anyone but yourself, <laughs> as everyone knows, you don't really totally always have control. And so all of the 14 releases I've done are something that I, I truly believed in and you know loved and just really wanted to put down for posterity. And I have no idea if, I, I don't imagine that that could have been the case with, with another label. So I think I made the right choice back in uh, 99 actually is when I started my label. And um, it was, that's, I mean, that's early for somebody doing a, a independent label. Yeah, I like to say that I inspired Radiohead, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you Probably. do you do trailblaze quite a bit, I would say. You write a blog that's very interesting about classical music, and, and we'll talk more about your opinions about classical music maybe in the uh, next segment. But you did just last week, I understand, play at this, what was it, classical beer jam or something at oh, Halloween yeah. for WQXR in New York? WQXR in New York wanted sort of... It, fear and beer for uh, for Halloween, so I did uh, like Toten Tanz and Danse Macabre for them, and and they served beer from various brewers. It was, I mean, it was it was different, and it was definitely fun. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the beer after. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the next piece we're going to hear is actually uh, written by the man at the piano here, Matt, Matt Herskowitz. Herskowitz. Tell us about it. Um, well, this is called Nagilara, so you could probably guess what it's based on. Uh, when you're going to do a tune as famous as um, Havana Nagila, I kind of thought of Matt immediately because when things get herskowitzed, they're kind of not all that recognizable. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a little while before you really hear the tune in this one. But, uh, you know, Matt is a um, awesome jazz pianist and has a very particular style. So this is what he's done with, uh, with the original Havana Nagila. It's okay. quite, a, quite a piece. <laughs> we cannot wait to hear it. Here they are again, Lara St. John and Matt Herskowitz with Herskowitz's version of the Hava Nagila, which they've called Nagi Lara on the new Classical FM. Thank you. 
A whole new take on the Havana Gila. That was Nagelara by pianist and composer Matt Herskowitz, who was here on our very own piano here at the Zoomerplex. And Lara St. John <laughs> catching her breath on the violin. What an amazing piece. We are going to hear more from this fantastic album, Shitsa, when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are live from Zoomer Hall with Laura St. John, who's joined by phenomenal pianist Matt Herskowitz. This has been a breathtaking uh, concert of music so far. All pieces from her new album called Shiksa, which is coming out in two days. She laughs every time I say the name. I think you're really delighted by that title. <laughs> well, I've always thought it sounded really cute, actually. It is um, cute. And it's, it's been, you know, 70 years since Portnoy and Herzog and all that. So it, it is, it is kind of, it's like saying gringa. It's, it, in my opinion, it's a very uh, uh, sort of a sweet, sweet little uh, word. Now, I would have to say that you are not one to have moved passively through the classical music scene. And you've ruffled the feathers sometimes, for example, with the cover of your solo Bach album, uh, which caused a lot of... Uh, Discomfort, I think, among some people in classical in the classical music world. Does that has that ever affected you, or if so, how? Not really. I mean, it's 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 kind of fallout from pioneering efforts. I think you know. I mean, if you do something new, you're always going to have people who disagree, especially in such a traditional field as classical. So, uh, you know, but the the basically the. Most people are kind of always with me, so that you know. I mean, I think a lot of people want want to see this, first of all, continue into the next generations and all that kind of thing. And it's just not going to do that if it sort of stays exactly the way it was in our grandparents' time. Yeah. How do so. you um, break what some people would call the monotony of you know the violinist getting dressed up to stand in front of an orchestra to play Tchaikovsky concerto again? Well, for example, in the Tchaikovsky concerto, you have lots of cadenzas. So I now, um, you know, sort of close up that second movement quite a bit. And um, there's all sorts of Romanian stuff in the cadenzas and this and that. So, I mean, you can always change stuff up. Um, uh, 
one thing that I'm doing is is basically doing stuff that hasn't been done before. So that's always kind of new. I mean, this entire album is all pieces either written for me or arranged by myself and Matt. And, um, you know, they're they're based on traditional tunes, but they're not necessarily tunes that have been heard for a very long time, certainly not in North America. So, um, you know, doing new things and commissioning concertos is is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, I've commissioned three so far and lots of pieces. And, you know, it's just, it's adding to the repertoire. And also I think young people feel more, uh, it, it, they have more of a connection with stuff that was written two years ago than they do stuff that was written maybe 250 years ago or even 100 years ago. You know, it's, it's just, it's more in this time. And so how do, you, of how do you find that balance? Uh, because sometimes some people are turned off by the idea of new music, whether or not they they may actually like the piece if they go to the concert. But what's the balance between uh, challenging the audience and then giving them something comfortable and familiar? Well, I think a lot of programs are now doing sort of a half-half situation. You know, so you'll have your Beethoven concerto, but then you'll have your you know Stockhausen. Actually, that's a that's a bad example. I'm maybe not, <laughs> I'm not his biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, or your piece written yesterday where the ink is still wet and, and, and yet have something that will, that will be familiar and be um, amenable to, an, to anybody in an audience. But yet, I mean, I think it's, it's possible to sort of to have that tradition but still change it up and, and have everyone learn and, and be happy. Also, communicating about it is important. You've started a blog called Sorry and Saint. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Sorry and Saint. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a lizard lover. <laughs> Amateur herpetologist. So right, yeah, and um, your lizard is figured prominently on your yes, in your photo on the I, blog. I live with a little dragon. <laughs> <laughs> on this blog, you have called the classical music world a schmuck fest. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, sometimes. I mean, I think that came from um, very recently in the Berliner Morgenpost. This was, I think, my last blog post. Um, uh, I was called like a Hexengeigerin, which in, in German means kind of a, a witch violinist. <laughs> and um, and the, the, the man who wrote the review, it was a very good review of the concert in the Philharmonie, but he intimated that now, you know, I would probably calm down some because I walked on stage with an unmistakable baby bump. So there you have not only sort of the, the traditionalist kind of very male view of a classical music reviewer, but also a German guy and all this kind of stuff. And just for the record, no, it wasn't that. <laughs> and, um, you know, and You're I made pregnant. that very clear, but, you know, hello, editors, hello, fact checkers, what's going on? And, you know, so it was sort of this kind of, this, this, this happens a lot for, it's not just female musicians, it's actresses, it's anybody in the entertainment world. You tend to get this kind of situation. I mean, nobody would ever, you know, sort of, if somebody walked on stage heavier than they would have liked and it was a man, they're not going to start talking about his, you know, reproductive organs. Uh, no. <laughs> so I just, I don't like that double standard in classical music or anywhere. And that's what I sometimes call a bit of a schmuck fest. Okay. And in classical music specifically, I have a two-part question. What do you, what bothers you the most about the culture inside classical music and what bothers you the most about public perception of classical music? Well, the perception does still tend, it's changing, but it's changing too slowly in my opinion. It does tend to be um, very much kind of, oh, that's music for my grandfather, it's all boring. And, you know, but a lot of people, all they've ever heard is Pachelbel's Canon in an elevator, so they don't really know what they're talking about. So the whole, <laughs> <laughs> the whole point is just to kind of get people in to the hall or into a situation. For example, um, I know here in Toronto this is happening a lot, especially in New York. There are places like uh, Le Poisson Rouge, which is a, um, it's a club, actually. And you go there and they have uh, pretty much once a week they have classical stuff. And I think that's a really great way to go hear that sort of thing because you can kind of get up without bothering anyone if you feel like it, as opposed to like if you're watching Mahler Fifth, you know, you have to sit in that chair for 95 minutes or whatever it is. And, and even for me, that's, that's very difficult. Um, and I just kind of feel like, like this sort of a, a bit more of an ease and, and you don't have to be absolutely quiet and you're not constantly shushed and there's no dress code and, and, and you can have your drink. Um, I think this is kind of a, a, a great future for it.
and, and it's certainly doing very, very well in, in the major areas, this kind of idea of, of classical music in, in clubs. Well, speaking of clubs and bars, one of the pieces that you're going to play shortly is called Bar Fight. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, it's actually called Varia Uni. It, uh, it's a, a takeoff kind of on a hammered dulcimer tune, again, from one of my old uh, uh, scratchy old LPs. Um, and it just, at some point, we were, we were sort of, I don't know, playing around with it. And, and Matt started with this kind of courting, honky-tonk stuff. And then all of a sudden, it sort of sounded to me like, you know, this, this really is evoking an image to me of sort of a saloon in the, in the Old West or something, even though it's a Romanian tune. And um, so we ended up doing a video actually right here in Toronto at the Cameron House called, um, well, Varia Uni and in brackets, Bar Fight with, um, with four actual stunt fighters and three country <laughs> western dancers and, uh, and, and, and me and Matt at the old honky-tonk piano there at Cameron House. If anyone's ever been there, it's Queen West. <laughs> it's a pretty funky place. And um, yeah, we just put that out uh, this morning. It's already like at like 4,000 views or something. Okay, well, you can check that out on YouTube just if you want to look it up. It's spelled V A R I A I U N I, Maria Uni on YouTube. It's a hoot of a video. Really right funny. now, we're going to hear music by John Camille Farah. This is called uh, Ya Zane. Lara St. John and Matt Herskowitz. <laughs> Thank you. 
There's a piece called Very A, Very a Uni uh, that was uh, taken an old dulcimer tune, uh, Lara St. John and Matt Herskowitz, a hilarious YouTube video that you should definitely check out. Uh, again, it's uh, V-A-R-I-A-I-U-N-I -I -I on YouTube. And apparently, uh, Lara did all the post-production herself on that video that they shot at the Cameron House. Before that, music by the Toronto composer, John Camille Farah, uh, yeah, Zane. And both of these are on Lara's new album called Shiksa, which is coming out on Friday. A great album. Such a treat to hear all this fantastic music and to see it in action. What a workout. Thank you both so much for coming and playing for us today at Zoomer Hall. And thank you so much for joining us. That's it for us at the Zoomer Concert Series for today. I'm Kathleen Kadrioka. See you next time.